This is the first of uh, a number of lessons in which we're going to focus on social groups and organizations. Refer to the first page of your third study guide and also chapter five in the textbook. Let's start with, sociologically speaking, what exactly is a group? And on the first page of the third study guide, there are a number of key characteristics listed that comprise or make up a group from a sociological perspective or point of view. I must admit I'm one of these people who still has a tendency to apply the term group to any situation in which I see a number of people collected. But bear in mind again, sociologists have a fairly specific way to define group. And it starts off, obviously, in the most basic way, you've got to have at least two people. The most basic of all social groups is what's referred to as a dyad, two people. Uh, a triad adds a third person. But groups can be very large, like organizations and schools. Or again, they can be very intimate and small like the relationship you have with your significant others. The key thing is, there must be some kind of basis for interaction. Whatever that might be can vary. Furthermore, the members feel they are part of the group. They identify with the group. They think of themselves as members. And the members of a group do, in effect, see themselves differently from others. They distinguish themselves in some form or fashion with others. It might simply be, hey, we're all in this together. On the other hand, it could be something formal, like the uniforms that uh, folks wear. On the other hand, the members do expect certain behaviors from each other. And last but not least, and this applied to me, I remember back when I was in middle school, uh, you have to not only consider yourself to be a member, but all the other people who consider themselves to be members of that group must also perceive you in the same way. Now, if that's not the case, you're not truly a member. That's what happened to me in middle school. I got in with, uh, again, the most popular group, or at least I thought that to be the case, only for me to realize, after a while, I was nothing more than a gopher. You all know what a gopher is, right? You go for things. And finally, one of my true friends came to me and said, are you an idiot? Don't you know what they're doing to you? So I thought that for a while I was in the group, but they never saw me as a true group. Now, aggregates and categories are different animals. Aggregates just refer to uh, a collection of people in space or time. The best example that I can offer would be uh, a number of people on a street corner waiting for the traffic light to change so they can move to the opposite side of the street. Categories consist of people that have some kind of a common characteristic, uh, a characteristic that they all share, but there's no basis for interaction as such. Uh, all the left-handed people at a particular school or organization all of the sociology majors at a big university, all the male students at a community college. Those are categories. But if you look back up here, I hope you recognize that sometimes aggregates can form a basis for interaction. That happened during 9-11, where, uh, again, individuals who didn't know one another were kind of thrown together in an effort to survive. Survival became that basis for interaction, and they evolved out of an aggregate into a group. On the other hand, let's take left-handed people. Maybe you're, again, part of a class comprised of left-handed people, and you really feel like left-handed people are being put down. So you put out a flyer, you start collecting with other left-handed students that you know, and you advocate for an organization. And the organization is going to, no pun intended, ensure the rights of left-handed people. Well, could you take that shared characteristic, left-handedness, 
could that become a basis for interaction? Bam up, you got a group. Now, groups are very, very important. They impact our lives in many different ways. Uh, sociologists using the functionalist perspective would tend to uh, perhaps focus on how do groups help us to meet key needs? What are some of the key functions they perform? Well, on the one hand, you can recognize that groups often work cooperatively to meet very important tasks. Those that are perhaps impossible, if not difficult, to meet if completed by only one person. So groups help us to meet what might be thought of as instrumental needs. They perform instrumental functions. On the other hand, through groups, we might very well meet needs associated with identification, affection, self-expression, support. So groups do perform expressive functions. They help us to meet expressive needs. Now, sociologists using the conflict perspective might argue that groups are involved in competition for limited but valued resources. Kendall highlights power relationships. Not everybody has access to power. Uh, hence, one group may seek to take advantage of another group, exploit that group, or as a result of uh, power relationship differences. Uh, some in a group may gain benefits or advantages that simply are not available to others in the group. Now, sociologists using the symbolic interactions perspective might focus on how does the size of a group impact the type or forms of social interaction that actually occur in the group. Go back to what we talked about just a moment ago, a dyad versus a triad. If you add just one person to a group, to a two-person group, do you change the dynamics? Well, I think if you give just a little bit of thought that you're absolutely sure. For example, could two gang up on the other? Could that third person bring in different viewpoints that perhaps the other two had never really considered? Okay? Plus, symbolic interactions are somewhat concerned with how perceptions held by one group might influence its members' perceptions of others and how they view and interact with these others. Now, on the other hand, you can look at other examples of how groups impact our lives. One very fascinating example for me was with respect to the Korean War. And in particular, what happened to American prisoners of war during the Korean conflict. American military leaders at the end of the war were very concerned and somewhat confused that unlike previous wars that American soldiers had participated in, some American prisoners openly cooperated with the enemy. A majority of American POWs, when released or exchanged at the end of the war, turned out to be very, very passive. Further research indicated that one out of three were informers one out of 10 gave reliable and regular information to the enemy. And the Chinese military, in particular, was able to use just one armed guard for every 100 American prisoners. And at the end of the war, 21 American POWs defected rather than return home. But what really caught researchers and the military brass somewhat unprepared was the high death rate. 38% of American POWs died in captivity. Later research indicated that a large number of these folks died of what was referred to by fellow POWs as give up itis. They just liked, they lacked the will to live. Now conditions in the camp were awful, but really no more so than those experienced by American POWs in early wars in prisoner of war camps. 
some torture did take place, but not enough to account for this passivity on the part of American POWs. So what was going on? Why were the Chinese particularly so successful in pacifying American prisoners of war? Well, it turns out that what they were doing was systematically attacking and breaking down group cohesion or unity. Now, they used a number of interesting techniques. Uh, all of the leaders and potential leaders now, this would include, and this is a photograph of uh, some American POWs, uh, this would include officers, non-commissioned officers, anybody who was highly educated, anybody who was uh, deeply religious. These folks were quickly segregated. Now, the Chinese assumed that those left over, about 95%, you just removed 5%, okay, uh, and the majority of those left over were 18 on average, 18 years of age, and most were no more than high school grads, and they were mainly draftees. And the assumption was by the Chinese, they wouldn't know much about the reasons for the war and would probably be less committed to American foreign policy. Plus, the Chinese frequently moved prisoners around, so stable groups couldn't, in effect, form. Third, any mail that came in was carefully censored. The only mail that got through to prisoners, no great surprise to probably any of you, was the mail carrying bad news, Dear John letters. Believe it or not, even some divorce summonses made their ways, their way into American POW camps in China. So literally, this effectively cut off many POWs from ties with previous groups. Last, but by no means least, the prisoners were required to be informers. In part, this was accomplished by prisoners being required to engage in a lot of self-criticism. Prisoners were put in a pretty tough spot as a result. If they talked too much, all that would generate would be mistrust and uncertainty among other POWs. Uh, literally, you wouldn't know who you could trust. If they talked too little, then they and any other members of their group were denied sleep and food. Therefore, it was in everybody's best interest to talk and push others to do the same. So what was the result? A lot of confusion, a lot of mistrust, even division, if you wish. And some POWs ended up with few, if any, social supports. Some were so effectively cut off from opinions, beliefs, knowledge of their fellows. They found they couldn't discuss or talk to other people, give advice or weigh the consequences of their action. Literally what some of these guys did is they created psychological selves they had made. So it was through a systematic attack on group loyalties that the Chinese effectively demoralized U.S. POWs. And they were effective enough that the majority of uh, the first group of liberated prisoners, when they arrived in Tokyo, they were given a chance for, to make toll-free calls home. Few of any people took advantage of that. And when given leave, the assumption is that they'd probably go in in small groups, as GIs often do. They didn't. They went in as, I, as isolated individuals. Now this clearly highlights the impact of group membership on our lives. When those ties are weakened or cut off, we become vulnerable, even sometimes losing the will to live.